It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! Woohoo! This week, starring special guest star Mr. Bill Gordon! Yeah, baby! Woohoo! Billy Bob! And we're going to talk about five tips for licensing solo piano tracks in TV and film. Yeah, it doesn't get any more interesting than that. <laughs> How are you, Bill? <laughs> I'm doing well, man. Good to see you. Thank Good to you see me. you. So I do have to make an excuse for myself at the top of the show, which I rarely do. I probably should do it more often, actually. Um I took a 15-hour flight home from a vacation on Saturday night, got home like midnight Sunday morning, uh, have had very little sleep. I'm in another time zone 10 hours away and jet lag beyond all possible belief, and I can barely say my name. So, uh, But I was determined to do this show with Bill because I love him so much. So right, B- yeah. Bill go. is a pianist, a composer, and a teacher, and he started playing professionally at the age... Oh, I forgot to tell you guys. My left ear is about 80% plugged from the plane flight, and I've got a, an earphone in the right side, which I'm only hearing Bill. Uh, so I don't know how loud I am, but what the hell. Anyway, Bill's a, a pianist, composer, and teacher. He started playing professionally at age 14, so that was like five years ago, as a drummer, no less, and leader of his rhythm and blues show band in Baltimore, where he sits right now. He later studied piano and composition at the Wiesbaden Conservatory in Germany. He graduated from uh, Berklee College of Music and has since composed, performed, and produced mainstream jazz, evocative solo piano ballads, quirky pop songs, and a quasi-avant-garde funk fable written for film and TV. And he's enjoyed decades of teaching. Hopefully the students have enjoyed it as well. Uh, he's recorded extensively, appeared as a soloist, accompanist, music director, and sideman, and band leader throughout the U.S. and Europe, and taught music privately at colleges in Boston, New York, Raleigh, Los Angeles, Miami, Vienna, and he's now back in Baltimore. Currently writes and performs a jazz, soul, and indie pop singer-songwriters, does annual European tours, and continues composing TV and film tracks. Um, sad stuff place in the glass castle nashville csi entourage etc much longer list than that um taught at sae in miami and i think you've attended more taxi road rallies than any other living human being other than me is that true well i don't know we've both been to all of them so okay um, and until this past year when matt hurt uh who had just moved back to switzerland wasn't there um he and i were the only two who we were sure had been to all of them did so, you pay to have him go back to switzerland just so you could have the mantle of being the longest oh, yeah, you've heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um anyway welcome to the show um so Thanks. yeah I, i'm really excited to have you on because Composers are driven to compose. They, you know, all musicians, uh, certainly writers, songwriters, and composers, want to make their music the best it can possibly be. Uh, and mm. sometimes that's too good. Not that you have to dumb it down, but you have to understand what the target is and what the music's purpose is. Somebody very wise once said to me, music is rarely the star of the show. And, mm. uh, yeah. and I think that that's very true. So, I want to talk out, uh, or start with things I mentioned in the email that our viewers got. Um, some obviously the viewers that are going to watch this after the fact didn't get the email. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you find that sometimes, Bill, the simplest pieces of music are the ones that are most easily licensed, or do you have a theory as to why that would be? Uh, I, you know, it's evolved. I I first got into this twenty years ago. Um, through a company in LA called Taxi, maybe you've heard. Of it. <laughs> and um, so, uh, in the early stages, um, there were um, a fair number of sort of full jazz jazz tunes that that got placed. Um, and then um, over the years, it's it sort of um, it's become less and less. And people now want things that generally can be um, pretty simple. Um, and even though, uh, you know, I'm a composer and I had, you know, great education and I love all kinds of music, 
I actually enjoy playing simple stuff. I don't, I like playing things that are complicated. I like really much chords. Um, I'm real big about playing um, uh, jazz standards, especially ballads with all these very voluptuous chords and stuff going on. But I also like, um, I like stuff stripped down. And I've got, you know, I've got my grandmother's Steinway. So I've got this really nice piano. So I don't need to really do a lot of stuff. And, um, and also, I, you know, I do my best to, uh, to not buck the trend. You know, if somebody wants something that's really simple, I'm going to give them something really simple. And that's because, again, it's the end user. It's, it's not a show. I'm not giving a concert. So, right. That's a great right? point. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Um, so you mentioned lush chords. Is it a fair statement to say that you've found that by using certain voicings that you can evoke emotional responses to the music without having to write a lot of notes or a lot of movement, but voicings are important? Wow. Gee. You know, that's a great question. I feel like I'm so close to it, and I've been doing it for so long. So you don't um, even know when you voice something in a really cool way? I, I sort of don't. I mean, I'm, I, you know, somebody will get back to me. I very often run things by um, some of the some of my colleagues that I've met at Taxi. Um, so, someone like Matt Hurt, and I'll, every now and then I'll think, well, I'm not sure about this, and I'll run it by somebody, um, and they will they will hear something and they'll say, wow, that's really nice, and, and I think, well, you know, I don't even know what it is. You know, it's like it was just part of the thing. Um, so uh, yeah, I. I just, um, I feel like, you know, for me especially, I, you know, I just started playing the piano until I was 20. So I don't have the kind of technical prowess that someone has when they start playing when they're a child. Um, and it became clear while I was going to Berkeley that I was not going to have that and it wasn't going to happen. But I, what I, you know, I'm a, I, I think like, like, you know, really uh, people who are really good songwriters, I, I'm a peddler of emotion. That's the thing. And I don't know, I was, I was very much drawn to Chopin um, when I was in school. And um, I find that that kind of evocative kind of atmosphere is something that I seem to be able to fall into pretty readily. Would you so, say it's a fair statement to say that the majority of your signings with publishers who are film and TV specific publishers in most, if not all cases, as well as the placements that have ultimately resulted. Would you say that it's a fair statement to say that most of those pieces have been solo piano pieces? Um, I would say probably two thirds. Okay, that's a pretty respectable like percentage. Yeah. Because, um, because I've got, you know, I do jazz trio stuff. I've got some stuff with a fuller band. Um, but, you know, at, at this point, it's, it, and especially I'm in a much smaller room now. Um, you know, you were actually in my place in Miami. I was. Many years. Yeah, that was a and really that, could comfortably put four players in, right? Exactly, yeah. And um, so um, we have yet to... Uh, you know, also, you know, acoustically, I don't know how this room is going to hold up, um, even with a drummer with a small kit and a, and a bass player. I, so, that I, I, but also, it's much less, um, you know, it's, it's, I enjoy hiring people, but at this point, it's, um, it's, uh, it's easier and it, right now it's less expensive to just do solo piano stuff. I also have a backlog. Um, it's taken me forever to get this place together. There were all kinds of acoustical issues that I knew I, I knew nothing about. We we had physics, which was actually acoustics, at nine o'clock on a Monday morning when I went to school. So you know, I'm, you know, we're all sitting in the back of the room, and it's like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, well, you know, bass frequencies, and uh, so we didn't care. Um, so uh, I I've got a nice backlog of, of sketches, and they're just solo piano things. I must have fifteen or twenty. And now I'm just in the final stages of getting getting the microphone, getting the stands off the floor and then hanging them from, from back here so that people can walk around more readily in here. Um, so I've got a nice backlog of stuff and it's all solo piano. Um, uh, and that's that's what I'm that's what I'm focusing on right now. Yeah, it's been my observation. I want to know if, if you've seen the same, but um, I think the solo piano pieces are some of the most 
readily and easily like I can't talk easily licensed songs uh, and that is uh, you know music is not the star of the show and yeah. oftentimes um, let's see I'm looking at my notes now oh they generate a lot of income um, do you want to tell people why it is that solo piano pieces like where they get used what types of scenes they get used in and why they generate better income especially on the performance side than something like you know a, a dramedy cue that might be in a reality show yeah well i'm so, i'm so glad you asked because i one of one of my favorite um stories is i th there was um uh, one of the jazz tunes i did a long time ago um uh was ended up um in nashville the tv show nashville mm -hmm. in a number of episodes and um it was all the couple of episodes I saw. It was always exposed. It was right after the commercial break, and my favorite one was when the the black there was still black on the screen, and then my tune came on, and then it was in front of the hotel, and this couple was about to go in and have their adulterous adulterous tryst in this hotel to my tune, and I thought, yeah, baby, that. <laughs> And see, so, that's why it says on your studio door, Bill Gordon, purveyor of porn music. Yeah. Well, you know, not, <laughs> I don't know what it's. I think they actually, I think it was more than that. I think they actually, you know, they really liked each other and everything. Um, oh, okay. But, uh, that changes everything. Yeah, it changes everything. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, it's like, you know, solo piano, you know, some of the stuff, especially that particular tune, which is, is it's sort of like an old fashioned jazz tune, like a 40s jazz tune. That really sets a scene, and apparently, whoever the music soup is who was doing Nashville back then, she really liked it because uh, they put it in three or four different episodes, and it was the same same tune. So I was very happy about that. Yeah, I um, think her name was Frankie Pine. She's an excellent Frankie Pine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I knew her back so, when she was just an assistant film editor or sound editor, yeah, actually, or music editor yeah, or something. Yeah. Back yeah, in the day, but there, you know, there was a lot of really great music in that show. You know, in the show itself. Um, but the other thing about solo piano is that um, it fit, it, it it falls behind dialogue so easily. It's not busy. You don't. It's it's not like an alto saxophone or a, <laughs> you know, or a strat. It's just back there, and you can put it. You, you can duck it down enough. You can still kind of hear it. Um, you know, it's 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 a restaurant scene. It's um, it's a cocktail party. Um, it's a hotel bar. Um, Usually, with a conversation taking place, it's going to last a minute or two. Well, see, that's that's one of the things I like it because the longer the play, the bigger the pay. Yeah. And in one of my very first play, play placements, the um, the scene lasted over four minutes. I got I got paid for five minutes. Of, wow. And, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that, that almost was, never happens, but it does oh, with solo piano. It was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. So, um, and it was that was actually a daytime. I was a, a soak um, way back in two thousand and three, four somewhere back there. I thought it was great. Um, so yeah, so I again, I don't know whether I'm really answering the question or not, but I, I think that um, I think solo piano just works well, um, and it's also you know, it's also in terms of if, if you've got to, you know, and again, I, I don't, I mean, all I don't, I, I got rid of all my keyboards when I left Miami. I have nothing except my grandmother's piano now. Wow. And um, so um, everything I do now is just that. So the, you know, in terms of production, it's just having the piano sound as good as I can. I've got a great piano tech here, a great piano tuner. Took, I went through five piano tuners to find this guy. Um, and also dealing with the acoustical properties in the room and you know finding out how to but the, in terms of getting it from from there to to the hard drive is really pretty straight ahead these days which cool. means when i go back to work tonight i will have some technological catastrophe <laughs> that i didn't see coming uh yeah, later I want to talk a little bit about your studio, which I can see bits and pieces of in the background. But first, I have to hydrate and find my earbud that just popped out. Ah, I needed that. Okay. Um, 
Have you seen any evidence that certain genres of solo piano are more frequently requested than others? Oh, uh, well, by now, most of the libraries I'm signed with and some of the music soups that I'm in direct contact with, they, they know they know what I do. And they, you know, so I'm, I'm doing, you know, you know, straight ahead jazz or things that are kind of jazzy. So those get pretty frequently played, but also very minimalistic stuff in just a couple of notes. Like so, introspective sort of very, stuff? Yeah, almost, almost, you know, almost drone-like. I mean, just something that doesn't really have much going on in it. And it's emotionally rather neutral a lot of the time. But wow. also, yeah, yeah, and, and it's like, but that's, that's what they want. I actually had someone say, can you, you know, I, I sent it and they said, that they, 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 got back to me and said, can you, can you make this more neutral, more emotionally neutral? And I thought, well, I've, no one's ever asked me that before. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I've never heard of that in all the years I've been in the industry. One time, never heard of it uh, since. Um, but usually um, those, those very minimalistic pieces, they, um, they can be really, really stirring. And they can, you know, if, if, if there's not a whole lot going on. And it, it goes, I mean, it goes, it goes right in there. Yeah. I like I love playing that stuff too. Emotionally neutral. Wow. Yeah, can you imagine? I don't even know how you do that, but I gotta say my first wife knew how to do that. <laughs> Bada boom. <laughs> anyway, I hope she's first wife, right? <laughs> I hope she's not watching the show today. Um, right. <laughs> um how about moods now that we've covered emotionally neutral? Um are there any moods that you seem to see requested over and over again, or is it run the gamut? kind of evenly uh the moods that i i that i tend to get placed for are um things that are happy bouncy you know things that are kind of you know like you do and you know it's like oh you know you get you know, everything is nice um and then on the other side things that are really pretty sad pretty melancholy things that um not quite morose but really introspective and um um slow and um uh just in you know, very you know, melancholy. Very, you know, and, and that, so you've got you can you've got this and this, and there's and for me, there's very little in between, except that one time when they wanted that neutral thing. I'm still stunned by that. I'm going to be bringing know, that enough it? that it, that's going to make it onto the main stage at the road rally this coming year. Yeah, I'm um, curious. I, I, you know, I, um, I wonder. I, something I don't know. That I've ever actually. Um, when I knew we were doing the show today, I started I started thinking about this stuff, and I, I remember that. But I don't know that anyone else has ever, I'd be curious to see if other people have ever been um, asked to do something that's, what, bring out the emotion. Can you take the emotion out? I, I don't know about that. Hang on a second. I'm going to kill Spotify. There we go. Goodbye, Spotify. It sucks a lot of my CPU while I'm doing the show. We can't have mm. that happening. Um, no, no. Is there a length that seems to be frequently re i know that you work with several libraries how many different catalogs uh, I, you know what i'm trying to not refer to them as libraries because 80 percent of the people who watch this video don't know what a music library is so for uh, the quick the quick education on that is it's a film and tv music specific publisher so when you hear the phrase music library don't think of big racks of books and some lady with thick glasses sitting behind you know reaching out to get your library card i don't even know if they have those anymore um how many different companies would you say that you've got music uh contractually obligated to at this point uh one moment please let's see uh you didn't know there was going to be a math quiz did you oh my god man yeah this is this is taxing me i would say um Oh yeah, okay. I had a nice um, a new library picked up 15, 15 tracks last summer. Um, probably seven or eight. Okay. So that's moment. yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I always try and dissuade people from falling in love with the first library that falls in love, or I should say, the first publisher that falls in love with them because they say. Oh, I've got a publisher. It's my publisher, and they're getting a lot of love and attention because it's early in the relationship, much like uh, romantic relationships. Yes, sure, sure. And then over time, other new people come in, and new music comes in, and maybe you don't get pitched as often, or maybe your stuff is getting a little long in the tooth because it's been sitting there for five years, whatever reason. So I always recommend that people should 
try and get their music in multiple different catalogs to kind of yeah. hedge their bets for the future. Yeah, I mean, my, 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 at this point, favorite library, because I don't know how the new one's going to pan out yet, but the, my favorite library, um, they have been consistent in terms of pitching my stuff a lot, even things that they've had in their catalog for 15 years. Wow, that's they, a good one. They still pitch it a lot, and they, um, and uh, they're also, you know, they're, um, they won't pick up something unless they're really prepared. See, one of the things I think is a problem for people when they first get into this is they don't realize that even if, uh, in this case, you know, a, a, a catalog, a music library, that kind of publishing, even if they like your music, mm -hmm. if they don't have an end user that can very likely use that music, they're not going to sign it because there's, you know, they're not going to sign it just because they like it. Which I think for a lot of you know those of us in the arts, you know, we're you know we're, we're pretty emotional, and pretty sensitive, and that is a hard little pill to swallow a lot of the time. It's like, well, you know, you don't you don't like my baby, right? Is it look how cute she is? Right? <laughs> um, but uh, it has to, it you know, you, they've got to be able to use it. And um, but I um, actually one of my earliest libraries, they they are still about my favorite because they really um, they. They pitch my stuff a lot, and they also um, they still generate pretty decent sync fees, um, given how much sync fees have generally fallen over the past ten or twelve years. So, um, what's kind of an average sync fee that you get when you get sync fees, um, and what kind of placements are they? Are they you know broadcast network stuff, or are they large cable nets, uh, and kind of the the range of what the sync fees might be? Well, the best are still the real networks. You know, ABC, NBC, CBS, um, um, some of the, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank here. Oh, my God. So some of the, some of the newer Netflix, um, some of those, they pay pretty well. But the, you know, the average now is somewhere between, you know, maybe, let's see, I, mean, I just did my taxes, so you would think I would have had this off the top of my head. I would say there's somewhere between, um, you know, 1000 to $2,000. That you've and that's split. your half and of the take. My, so, my my half of that, if, if it's a two thousand dollar thing, I get a thousand bucks. Right. And the uh, most recent one I got was was seven seventy five. So that must have been you know sixteen hundred and something seventeen hundred dollars. So let's say that you get something placed in a prime time show on ABC and it runs for a minute and a half. Um, it's under. You know, it, it's a dialogue scene in a restaurant, a husband and wife out celebrating their anniversary or Valentine's Day, and they're involved in a deep conversation, and, and your piece runs for a minute and a half. So let's say that the sync fee is like 2500 bucks. You get half of that. Is there any way to ballpark an estimate of what you might get on the performance royalty on the back end because that aired on a major broadcast net? Yeah, I look at this in terms of, of you know, how, what it does over a period of three or four or five years. Um, so I think, um, you know, again, I think that, you know, the highest sync fee I've seen in the past couple of years is a couple of thousand bucks. So there's that up front. Um, and then uh, depending on syndication and, um, you know, actually over half of my BMI is foreign. You know, wow. people in, in France and, and Germany and Denmark, uh, they, when I look at my, my foreign thing, they, they seem to love what I do, which is, which is great. Um, uh, but um, but I, it's a placement like that over, say, three years will probably put maybe maybe three or $4,000 in my pocket. Um, I'm sorry, in our pocket, because I want to make sure Na my, Nancy, my lovely wife, I thought you were going to say in our 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 pockets. I thought you were going to say the publisher's half, but no, it's Nancy's half. Um, no, 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 Professor no. Lacoste, don't mention company names in the chat, please. Um, just because other people will be watching later, and then they're going to get bombarded with a bunch of people reaching out to them. Um, as a matter of fact, Ariana, can you delete that? Yeah, it's refreshing already. All right. No. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm uh, careful here not to mention names about anything. Right, because people get carried away that are newbies that don't know the oh. proper etiquette. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about etiquette for a minute. I was going to get to that much later in the discussion, but cool. 
uh, how important is it to act like a, a responsible professional adult in the relationship oh, when yeah. people reach out to you and go, hey, I, I think I can get this piece of music used. I'd like to sign it into my catalog. Um, you know, how, how should one react to that? What are kind of the next steps? Uh, I know obviously when people hang up the phone or finish reading the email, they do the happy dance and that's certainly understandable. Sure. But, um, yeah, talk about the etiquette a little bit, would you, Bill? Well, one one of the things um, you know, I do uh, I do a, a crash course in music business, um, and in the in the setup to that, in the in the very first introductory remarks, um, I mentioned that um, uh, common sense and good manners are really important because a lot of people look at the music industry as being this this evil monolithic empire that's out to make them really unhappy and um you know it's uh it's just being polite and being reasonable um and understanding putting yourself in the other person's shoes it's very very important um i in, this is something i've learned through taxi as, as well and the problem even at least as much through my own experience um you know, a follow-up call to make sure the MP3 got there uh, back in the old days to make sure the cassette or the or the or the CD got there. I remember making burritos for you, right? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but one follow-up call to be sure that they received it, and then that's all. And then don't ever ask, um, "Well, did you listen to it yet? Do you did, that, did they like it?" It's like that, 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 all you want to make sure is that they actually got the thing. And that, to me, is part of the etiquette. Is if they, you know, if they like it, they'll be sure to get in touch with you. So that's right. that's a given. So you don't need to do that. And also, one follow-up call for that situation is plenty. If they got it, they got it. And then if they didn't, send it again and do another follow-up call on that one. But you don't you don't call and 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 pester people about that they listen to it because it really puts you right back in sort of amateur night. Mode. Yeah, and and then when you say and they go, yeah, I listened to it, but I can't really use it. Thanks for submitting it, though. And you say, what didn't you like about it? What oh, can I do to make it better? Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. I've got some other stuff that's not EDM. I've got some jazz stuff you should hear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why, you know, to a large extent, they want to remain somewhat anonymous, just because they're in the business of getting music placed and earning money, versus uh, they don't get paid for educating the masses. Yeah, generally not. And, and also, um, uh, you know, if they do educate us, it's usually inadvertent. They don't really mean to be a mentor. They just, it, it's an aside, they say. Um, but people who do these things, they listen to a lot of music every day. And so they just, they don't, they, you know, they've got to, they've got to move on to the next thing. And again, um, I was lucky enough when I was in New York, I had a buddy I went to school with who worked with Clyde Davis. And he invited me over to meet Mr. Davis. And um, Mr. Davis had this operation where he would he would play a cassette. This is this is like 1979, and he would play a cassette, and he listened to maybe maybe 10 or 15 seconds of it, and he'd take it out and he'd throw it over here, and he had this big pile over here, and then he had this much smaller pile. He would listen to it, if he listened to it for maybe 15 or 20 seconds, then he would put it in that pile mm -hmm. because. Whatever they're listening to, it's got to, you know, now in his case, I mean, it was, he was pitching to, you know, it was for artists that he was, he was representing, but it had to, it, it's got to, it's got to do that thing. And for the world of film and TV thing, they've got to say, oh, that will, that's what I, that'll work, right? And that's, that's what we're going for. Uh, I always ask my classes, did I answer the question? Because I want to make sure I answer the question. Yes. <laughs> Honestly, I'm so jet lagged. I wouldn't know if you didn't, but I'm sure you did. Okay. I'm gonna take advantage of that. <laughs> um, no, we were talking about etiquette. Yeah, you answered it. Um, good, good manners never, never fail. Good manners are a good thing. Um, length of solo piano cues. Do you find that most of the catalogs that you write for want sixty second, ninety second, two minute? Is there any length ballparkish that is recommended? Yeah, I actually, um, I anticipated some of this. I went back and I looked at a bunch of things just to make sure I knew how long these, these, these tracks are. Yeah, the average length is, is 90, it's, it's a minute and a half to two and a half minutes 
almost everything that I've got out there is either it's either 90 seconds or it's two and a half minutes. It's somewhere in there. And how is a piano cue constructed? Um, let's talk about the difference between an instrumental and an instrumental piano cue. Oh, my God. Um, Excuse so, me, nerd. Can you turn up my Xanax drip a little bit, please? <laughs> uh, it's I, we get questions from people that see our listings that say they're looking for either an instrumental and, and or an instrumental cue, and they go, well, "What's the difference?" So explain what an instrumental is first, and then we'll go on to what an instrumental cue is. Oh man. Well, actually, I think this is a question that um, a lot of people have different answers for. And um, uh, I think that um, I know that um, Dean Krupani had a, had a really great um, answer for this on one, one of the forums a while ago. And you know, it's um, a, a generally, and I think this is right. A cue is um, something that's that's really doesn't draw a lot of attention, but an actual song will draw attention to it. So when you talk about um, an instrumental. That's more like, in my mind, is more like a song, so it's going to get a little more attention. Um, it's like the TV show the, the Wire, but it had a lot of great instrumentals in there, um, and they get your attention. But the cue actually just enhances the scene. It, it, it generally is something you don't notice. It's like being, it's like being a really great producer or film director. You don't, you, they're, they're invisible. You don't really see right. them. You just, you see it, it, and that's um, so. That's my take on that, and I would imagine that a lot of people that I know in taxi will will be emailing me and texting me for the next couple of days saying, "You do, she, what are you what are you talking about, right?" But that's that's my take on it. Um, no, I, I that, think that that's accurate. I would also add to that that not only is an instrumental like a song in that it may draw more attention, but it's constructed more like a song where it's probably got, you know, a full intro and a verse and yeah. a chorus and a bridge yeah. and an outro. It's yeah. kind of like a song, but without a vocal on it, uh, you know, yeah. it'll have some touches of melody that the piano may pick up just so it doesn't sound like a, a rhythm track. Um, but a cue is constructed differently in that it will have practically no intro at all or a very short intro um, and basically be an A section all the way through, maybe, a, you know, kind of a B section in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was something that really threw me at first. Um, even back, this was, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, the word cue wasn't used as much. Right. Uh, and uh, I would do these things, and for me to have a piece of music um, that didn't have a contrasting section, didn't have a B section, was one of the most musically abhorrent things in the world. So I know I got to go somewhere else, right? Otherwise, it's some new age piece of sort of you know eating air. And I I would do these things, and I would you know, and a lot of the stuff would get kicked back, and they'd say, "Look, we just we want one feeling, one emotion." That's right. all we want. Don't want to change because as soon as soon as you change, it's like I I only, only went to a G chord. No, no, it's you know it's too much of a change. So um, yeah, it's um, yeah I and so I have really honed it down um, as much as I can. So, um, uh, it's funny. I know you well enough. I've known Bill for easily twenty years, and uh, like you mentioned earlier, uh, when he still lived in Miami. Uh, I, I was at his house and went out to dinner with he and his wife, Nancy, and visited his studio. Bill is a perfectionist, um, and he's a composer's composer. So it's got to be really hard for you to write stuff that is very simple and stays mainly on an A section and doesn't have... <sighs> stuff that doesn't do that is more like scoring to picture but without picture but that makes it yeah. very hard to use because what are the chances your score in air quotes is going to line up with how the film is cut it's it's not so basically they could only use sections of it um so that's why instrumentals i think evolved into cues because cues are written to be used in pieces yeah. Um, and, yeah, and stay on one central theme from beginning to end. So let me ask you, um, very often in the taxi listings, you'll see that it says, uh, 
looking for short to no intro, um, keep it moving forward, you know, by adding instrumentation as it progresses, build it up, break it down, build it back up, and then end it on a stinger or a buttoned ending, which is da 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 da. <laughs> so <a> very <laughs> simplified version, of course, but it's the only one that comes to mind when I'm this jet lagged. So, how do you treat that as a solo pianist? Um, do you crescendo up to it and bum home, you know, hit a big Beethoven chord, or do you just land on the root and let it ring out? What are some of the things that people who are desirous of doing what you do should understand about that? Yeah, well, the thing is, I mean, one of the things about the, the taxi listings, um, having read them now for 20, 25 years, um, it's like there is a certain amount of interpretation and there's a certain understanding that you get only by reading them and submitting, getting the critiques back, going on the forums, doing all these things to see where, where you might be missing it and where you might be doing well so you can get not miss so much and even get better at what you're doing well. Um, so um, when I see these things about, you know, adding instruments and building it up, I, I'm sorry to say, but my, my first response is, well, of course, you know, it's like that's what music <laughs> does, right? Well, you, it's like, okay, you know, you get out of bed, you're kind of sleepy, and then you get going. It's like, that's, that's what it's going to do. Um, pianistically, um, uh, I will... Um, when I see something like that, I I tend to shy away from it because I'm afraid that what I'm going to do is spend a lot of time with something that no one can really use because what I'm going to do, instead of adding instruments, I'm going to add more either um, uh, 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 more harmonic texture, you know, other you know chords, I'll make the chords denser, I will do something rhythmically, I'll start doing something over here. Um, and then because i think most composers you know we have very vivid imaginations and we just start doing these things we hear a little thing and we think oh and then we follow that next thing i know i've got four and a half minutes and i can i listen back to it and i think well, no one can use this you know i don't even i don't even like it it's like i can't it's like i don't want to hear this so i just as a solo piano player i map it out um, um when you study composition in school um, uh, it's it's a really big deal not to do it at your instrument. You're supposed to do it at your desk. You're supposed wow, to I didn't know that. It. That's great. No, yeah, I mean, so you know, get away. I mean, I, I had these great teachers at Berkeley, and they were they were they were they they had these wonderful vocabulary, uh, this wonderful vocabulary for this stuff, which I won't use here. But it was just get away from your instrument, sit down at your desk, hear it here, let your imagination do it without this getting in the way. So I will actually. I will take some little sketch and then I'll walk all the way from the piano all the way over here and I'll sit down and I'll just sketch it out and I'll say, okay, well, I got this, I got, okay, this is, this is D minor. Okay. Now I'm going to, okay, now here I'm going to do that and then I can do that. Okay. Now that's going to be about a minute and a half. Okay. So now if I do that and then I can kind of bring it down. Now I got a little more than two minutes and then I'll sit down and play it and work with it um, until I find it really satisfying. And then I come over and I hit, uh, I still call it play and record. <laughs> you know, I hit, I hit Apple space bar, right? That's all right. I, I still call it tape. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. I still call it a record. Right. And so I just come over, I just turn the thing on. I will do a couple of passes. Um, and, uh, then I will move on to the next thing and listen to it you know, later that day, that night or the next day and hope that it's, it sounds okay. That it worked okay. Is there one piece of music that you've written and gotten signed uh, with a publisher that has been your evergreen piece of music that somehow it seems like every year it gets a placement? Uh, yeah. I know that Matt Hurt and many of your contemporaries have been around Taxi for a long time. They all seem to have that one piece of music that has earned more than all others. You have one? Matt Hurt has, Matt Hurt, you know, the thing about Matt, and I think all of us who know him, Matt's worst piece of music is really good. So that's his low <laughs> bar, right? And then it goes up from there to total magnificence. And he's written a jillion pieces of music. And you know, I remember I remember his rig in LA. It looked like some high school kid's rig. 
right? right. It's like some some kid in the eighth grade, except for the he had the original NS10, you know the the, the, the you know the and that was the giveaway. It's like oh, this is serious. Um, yeah, I've got this one tune. Um, it's called that. Oh, can I say the name of the tune? Yeah. No, it's called that sweet thing in G. Happens to be in G. It's this little jazz tune. And uh, that 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 got used in Nashville a bunch of times. It's been used. Um, I mean, I, I, that thing will the you know money will drift in. It'll get placed you know, every at least three or four times a year. And I wrote that tune. I wrote that tune fifteen years ago. And is yep. it a relatively simple piece of music? One moment, please. <laughs> it's all right. Test patterns going up. Yeah, okay. Okay. I, dead air. Dead air. Well, you know, in, in the in the world of jazz, it is relatively simple. It's got it's got it's, it's a little bit like a Fats Waller tune, and it's got this nice sort of leisurely thing, and it's not too kind. Of, the melody is really pretty clear. It's pretty easy to hear the melody, and um, the chords are pretty simple. And yeah, and it doesn't it doesn't go any place too far. It's like a, the way a, a jazz tune evolves. Right. You've got, section you hear the a section again with a little bit of this and then you have a bridge and you have the a section and then we're done and but that tune i uh, and nancy loves that tune she she she, she says have you got any places on on that sweet thing you do right lately <laughs> that's funny um yeah. There are a couple of others, but that's that's the that's the one that always stands out. It, it seems like every single one of you, I call you guys old timers because you've been around Taxi for so long. Yep. You all have that one thing. Well, you have many things in common, actually, that I think all contribute to your success. But I think you all have that same story to tell, which is one piece of music that just like. And it's maybe not your best piece of music, um, but it's the the most licensable piece, and it gets used over and over. Yeah, I um, actually, I played a really, really nice wedding gig here last year. Um, there's this very fancy building for the Engineers Club downtown. They've got this seven foot uh, um, uh, canabe, which is in really great, great shape. And these people heard me play a seven, somewhere. Seven foot what? A canabe, a grand piece of uh, 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 make of piano. Actually, it's been made here in Baltimore and it's really well maintained. What's that so brand the, again? Canabe, K N A B E. A B E. Kanabi. Kanabi. It, mean, like it means. You it say means, Kanabi, um, I say Kanabi. No, it means. <laughs> no, it means. Uh, it means. Uh, it means a little kid. Um, but it was a. It was a nice piano, a nice room, and they went online. They heard a bunch of my tunes, and they heard this tune, and they said, "Will you play that tune for us while you're there?" So they they pulled up a couple of tunes, and that was that was the one they wanted to hear the most. And so it's you know people just like that tune. I had to relearn it. I had to sit down. And listen to it because I never wrote it down. I had to relearn it. Okay, what is that? And anyway, <laughs> that's my long story on that. Um, can you list off a couple of mistakes that you made early in the game when you first <laughs> joined Taxi? <laughs> probably I'm thought, really oh, I'm going to get a record deal as a jazz artist and, and become famous and fly around in a private jet doing jazz concerts. And then at some point you realize, oh, film and TV is where the bread and butter income comes from. Uh, are there any misconceptions or mistakes that you had early in the game that you can uh, warn others not to make? Oh man, there are so many. Um, it's one of the reasons why teaching this uh, these music business workshops is emotionally very trying because <laughs> I I tell these people about some of my really really just bad judgments over the years, and, um, and it, you know, it's painful. You know, and I do I try to make a, a light of it, but it's still painful. Are you talking about since I've been with Taxi, or since the since I started doing this music thing. Um, since Taxi, because you weren't really um, doing much of film and TV placements prior to Taxi, right? No, no, I had always followed a very um, just. I, I, I went to music school. I just wanted to learn about music, and when I got out of music school, I thought I real I realized, oh, I, I what will I do now? And I had you know I had to play gigs and, and teach and do stuff, and, but. Um, um, I would say, you know, it took a while. I, okay, I joined Taxi in 95, and I pitched a lot of stuff. Um, we used to, um, we used to send, we sent the ca cassettes, and we had to wrap them up in a certain way. It was called a burrito, and put rubber bands around it. It was very specific. 
And I spent a lot of time going down to the post office and sending these things in. I submitted a lot of material. I think I submitted something like maybe 100, 150 tracks in a, in a couple of years. I had a lot of back catalog. So uh, I would get these really nice uh, screener comments saying some this is really great music. and um, But nothing happened with it until around 2000. And then I got um, I, I got a lot of forwards, but no response. Why do and, you think you got no response? Because this is a really important point you just brought up. We hear from newer members all the time. A lot of people that don't come back for a second year of Taxi, even when they're getting forwards, which means that we've forwarded their music to the entity that has requested something yep. and they made it through the filter. Uh, they get frustrated. Some people think, gee, maybe those listings aren't real or maybe the people on the other end aren't listening to the stuff um of course you know better now because you've been around the block for a long time and you yeah. understand how the system works but um that, is it a fair statement to say that's completely normal that you get a bunch of forwards and you might not hear from anybody for you know months to a year to a couple of years yeah i still submit pretty frequently and I still have a pretty good forwarding rate. And, the you know, a lot, of, you know, what you just said is true. You know, you submit it and filter number one is the screener. And the screener's the taxi, um, they're, you know, these people, they're no slouches. They know what they're doing. So if it passes that filter and then they send it to the listing entity, that listing entity has to be able to use it. And that's an even smaller filter. So the, you know, the, the taxi screener filter is this big, their filter is this big. Right. Um, and it just, they have to be able to, it goes back to, if you're doing licensing, film and TV music, um, they have to be able to use it. No matter, they could love the piece. This, this is what happened. I, I had screeners um, uh, tell them, you know, oh, this, is, this is really great, but, but, but no, you know, nobody, you know, I, I don't know if you're going to find any use for it. And so it was very satisfying to the composer. Um, but yeah, you're going to have a lot of forwards. You can have years. I had years of forwards. I had forwards from 96 until 2000. And wait a minute, one moment, please. I wrote this down somewhere. <laughs> Where the hell was that? Okay. Um, well, there it is. Wow. Okay. So I joined in 95. I, I started submitting a lot of stuff in 96. Um, and I said, and I had all these forwards, and it wasn't until 2003 that I signed my first deal. Wow, so it took seven years from the time you started seven years, submitting. Seven years. And I had a lot of back catalog, and, 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 and the thing is, once this first place um, signed it, um, uh, it, it they, they, picked up, you know, they picked up a lot, a lot of it. They picked up like seven tracks right away. And at the same time, another um, library and other catalog of uh, one of the one of the same tracks right right and there was there was kind of this tug of war with them i remember um, that uh, you know uh, that? our mutual friend i believe uh jim long laughed when he yeah. saw the ad that i wrote the headline two publishers fought over my music because i joined taxi and he thought yeah. that was the funniest thing he'd ever heard but it was a true story well, I, w I was thrilled. I thought, oh, yes, I have finally arrived. Right. right. <laughs> a I bidding war for solo piano. This, right, exactly. This was great. Um, and then they uh, they asked for some more. I sent them some more directly, and they ended up signing a good 10 or 12 of these, of these tracks. Um, so, my, so I didn't make the mistake of having big expectations. I didn't know what to expect. I'd never done this before. But I got a good feeling. Um, I think I told you the story. I got this thing from Taxi, and I thought it was, um, you know, I saw it was from L.A. To me, it was like Hollywood Records. And Hollywood Records, remember them? They, they would say, hey, kid, you know, you give us 500 bucks, we'll publish your songs, right? <laughs> so I, I took this thing, I set it aside. Nancy came in. Nancy and I, we never read each other's mail. She picked this thing up. She looked at it. She said, what's this? I said, oh, it's it's some some piece of jive from 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 Hollywood, and she said, I like this has a good vibe to it. I think you ought to check this out. Nancy's right? the smartest woman I've ever met. Oh my God! <laughs> I, absolutely, absolutely. I, I oh man, I learned very early on that if we disagreed, I should just relent because she was right. Um, there you go. 
So, um, so I just, I didn't have any expectations. I went into this thing and I, this, this stuff started happening. People liked the music. My next big mistake, or the mistake I made, was that I started cranking stuff out. I thought, wow, they love everything I do. Not realizing that what they loved about it was that it was this back catalog that when I recorded that stuff and composed it, it was all from the heart. I, 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 the commercial value of it never entered my mind. So they were picking up on that emotion peddling thing that I apparently was able to do. Um, so I started cranking this stuff out and I would submit it. I would send it directly to them. And I finally, um, uh, I got a call. And this is someone that we, um, many of us know and admire. And she was um, very, very forthright. And she just said, essentially, Bill, you have to stop sending us um, all this B work. No, we can't use it. And it's just, it's just clogging us up. Somewhere in me, I had the wherewithal and the maturity to say, oh, I understand. Thank you so much. And I look forward to working with you in the future. I mean, suddenly I was much more an adult than I really am. Of course, I hung up the phone and then I ran around the studio. I went totally nuts. But it was one of the best calls I ever got because I realized that my thinking was, well, you know, it's background music. It's just a TV show. You know, it's like they're right. Really, does it have to be it's got to be really 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 good it has to be and it has to be well recorded it doesn't have to be you know Deutsche Grammophon it doesn't have to be <laughs> you know Sony but it has to be well enough recorded and it has to be good enough and um, that really that set me straight that was really um that, that was a great learning thing but that was a big ass mistake I made and uh, but she straightened me out and was, I'm very grateful to this day. Although at the moment, after I hung up the phone, I was, I was a very unhappy guy. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, I I know you're a perfectionist. That must have crushed you. Not you're not egotistical, but you have a very strong perfectionist component in your psyche, and so you okay, probably also, worried. You know, what could I have done better? In that case, I guess you could have. So it was very mature of you to. Yeah, and I don't know where I got that because that's very uh, often not how I respond to a situation. And um, <laughs> but again, you know, there, there is that thing about um, you know we, we write these pieces of music and they really are in a way our offspring, and we want people to say you know how wonderful they are, and sometimes they're not. Um, sometimes they're not let Let's shift gears for a second and talk about music theory. Um, yeah. Ew, yeah. Ew. See, I, I wanted to ask I, you about this. Because, about I'm having a good time. I'm not talking about music. Um, I spoke at your class. Here's, here's what I think of music theory. Okay, see the name of my book? <laughs> Isn't it hard to get something in frame backwards? It, well, how's that? There you go. Perfect. Uh, I'll hold it, it up. Hold it up a little longer. Oh, you, oh, you think I can reframe it? You think I can do this voice? How about yeah. that? It's music, yeah. not theory. Damn it, by Bill Gorman. Can they buy yeah. that on Amazon? They can buy it in a lot of places. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Ebook version. But the thing is, I think the very term music theory is it's like oh stop. You know, it's like oh the theory of love. What what the hell is that? Um, you know, music is it's. It's got a grammar, it's got an architecture, um, it's got all these components. It's like a language, you know, language has you know, verbs and nouns and, and, and adjectives and, and, and prepositions, but you know, you're, you're not aware of them when you're speaking. You're not, you only become aware of them when you're learning how to really handle a language. So to me, it's not music theory, it's the structure of it. It's like, okay, this is a melody, okay, this is the part we sing. And these little blocks of sound that support that melody, we call those chords. And then underneath that is a slower moving, low, low pitch kind of melody we call the bass line. And that's what you're hearing in most songs most of the time. And it almost always is comprised of just seven notes from a set of notes we call a scale. And so it's not theoretical. I mean, look how, I mean, I slide into this. I mean, you can see, I mean, I am. Yeah. Like, and like and I, the best part is you can't see what we're seeing, but you're pixelating right now. You're mostly not pixelated throughout the show, but every now and then 
you must lose a little bandwidth on your end, and you look like something out of Terminator, like after Arnold gets half his face blown <laughs> off. <laughs> Phantom of the Opera might be another right, right. description. Of, so it's pretty funny to hear you talking about music, not theory, with half a face. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my feeling about music theory. Uh, hold the book up again. A couple of people asked where they could get it, and, they, and I think that it'd be good for them to see the title. It's not... It's music, not theory. Damn it, by Bill Gordon. Um, I actually, you sent me the book years ago, right? I, I remember reading it back then because, yeah, I, I mean, think, um, it wasn't Hannah the, the songwriter guitar player. Yeah. yeah, I wanted her to take a look at it. She well, thought it was good. I think she I, did actually take it. Um, at the time, she was about 14 or 15, I think. And I've got to say, Hannah was the reason I ended up publishing uh, Robin Frederick's book, because Hannah read the first three chapters and wrote a really good song after yeah. she read it. And I said, Absolutely. well, you know, if, if a yeah. high school freshman can write a good song, who's never written a song, by the way, yeah. after reading that, then... So I, I borrowed the money from her college fund to publish that book, because back then we had to buy a pallet full of books. Sure. Um, Let's talk about your studio setup, which I can see part of behind you. Um, I, yeah. I, I saw the studio in Miami, uh, and even back then you had a few, I think you had an ARP keyboard, right? Uh, an ARP synthesizer? Yeah, it was on the wall, right? Right. Um, so now you left all those keyboards behind, you've just got your grandmother Steinway in there. Uh, what kind of mics do you use typically? Um, the, two, the two primary mics are... Um, AKG uh, 241s. Okay. They are, they're the 441 without all of the uh, different patterns, uh, without all the bells and whistles, and also they're about half the price. Really great. They're you know they're these these, these big um, big diaphragm condenser mics. They're kind of the romantic mic. Okay. Um, and uh, so I have just in the past um, couple of months found out how to mic this piano in this room because the room in Miami, it had no acoustical anomalies that you really heard. Mm. And I got lucky. I had Nancy's guitar teacher came in and um, he said, have you tried micing the piano like this? And he put these mics in this really improbable looking way and it sounded great. So that's what I went with. So in here, I can't get, even though the room's been treated like crazy, I can't get too much of the room in it because the room's so small. It just doesn't, add it and do it right so now i've got these two 241s in this really improbable configuration i've never liked close mic pianos i remember back in the in the late 70s and 80s um the jazz piano back then was a seven foot yamaha and because it was very bright and you could always tone it down but it was in, but they wanted to start right and they put these mics right on top right in the piano and i to me it was it was a horrible sound but I had to, if that was the, the best place for one mic and another mic over there. And then this little um, uh, uh, small diaphragm condenser is a um, Audio-Technica 4041, which just brings out this, this really nice, clean thing. And I just, um, so I've got these two panned hard left and right. Mm -hmm. And this one is dead center, red threshold. And I am finally pretty satisfied with the sound. And I've, I've sent this to, um, actually, you, you're right here on my list. <laughs> you're on my list to, to send my piano sound to because I want to get, I want approval from everybody at this point because I, I've, I've sort of lost trust in my own ear because of all the changes well, that have happened. My feeling about miking pianos, and I've spent uh, a you know, ungodly number of hours uh, miking them uh, in my past career, is that, I started out doing what other people did that I learned from, which was, you know, they, they close mic'd most everything. Sometimes they would open the lid and mic stuff from three feet back. But right. typically they would kind of shoot one thing at the, you know, the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows. And I always thought, well, that's dumb because most everybody works in the middle octaves. And, and so I started coming up with my own miking scenarios and found yeah. that there was no mic position that worked for every song or every player it depends on the player's dynamics it depends on the octave you're working in um 
So I just adjusted accordingly and didn't go by any prescription of, you know, the mic should be 14 inches apart and they should be at a 30 degree angle, blah, 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 blah. Right, right, I just right, stick, right. stick my head under there and hope that the stick holding the lid up, you know, doesn't get knocked <laughs> out on my way out. And I, and I would move my ear around and just go, oh, okay, so that sounds really good right there and shove a microphone there. And, and yeah. the bottom end, frankly, um, a lot of times just has a lot of rumble in it because the the strings are down there and low end stuff kind of resonates down there under the soundboard so i always found that rolling off bottom end on the bottom end made for a better sounding bottom end it really does i mean i rolled <laughs> in this room i've got the bottom end rolled off quite a bit going in on both mics um but even though it's a it's a i mean this is a small piano it's, it's not even six feet long so it's a short string piano but it still has a lot of bottom end to it. Um, the other thing is that the soundboard on the piano, it it amplifies everything. It's the amplifier in the piano. Yeah. And so, yeah, if you aim a mic at the bass, it's a little bassier, but it's not that much bassier. So the, the sound is actually coming out sort of evenly. Right. And uh, when, I, when I was um, getting really exasperated, um, called a buddy of mine in, in New York who has this really nice piano studio and he said, okay, take one mic. He said, just take one mic and spend as many days as you need and find out where the best sound in that room is. And he made a couple of suggestions, some of which I thought, that's that's absurd. Well, one of them was exactly right. Because that one mic, I mean, it's right, it's right off the bridge. Um, and then he said, and then take find your second best sweet spot and then Put them together and see what it sounds like and that's what i did so you start um, with one mic and uh um and i and also the fewer mics the better i mean the only reason that i put this little um pencil mic in here is because um it just needed a little it just needed something in the middle just a little something and uh, you, you, again it's threshold so can you move your head one way or the other so we can see that mic in the middle this little guy okay so that's your distant mic uh, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it looks to be like three feet off the deck. Yes, it's an ear because the, where, where the ears are is where that mic is, and it's a it's a real, real sweet spot. Completely unpredictable. I mean, it's right where the where the two bridges cross in the back of the piano. You would think that would be harmonic hell, but actually, it's beautiful. I think it's the small diaphragm. It just it's very clear. Um, the other thing about you have to follow, uh, you know, there's a lot of possibility for phase cancellation with the piano sound. You're right. Right. Yeah, when you right. mentioned you had that third mic up there, I was biting my lip. Yeah, yeah. I I, I went into this with um, uh, with a lot of testing and a lot of, um, you know, one of, one of the great things about teaching in these audio schools is that I can run this stuff by somebody who's, you know, who's 30 years old and they've got great young ears and I can say, okay, how am I doing here? How's this down? Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, I mean, the first thing is the three to one rule is really, really important. Right. You gotta make sure that you, you follow the three to one rule. And, um, uh, I actually, I thought that this was going to cause phasing problems, but it, it doesn't. And I don't know why. And I really don't care. I'm not teaching acoustics. So it's like, I'm happy. I just want to get back. I want to be able to sit down and just, you know, do the stuff again. Um, let's shift gears away from the studio now and talk about the Taxi Road Rally, our annual convention, because you've been to all of them. Um, I, I know this sounds self-serving, and maybe it is a little bit, but I, I really genuinely want to know this from you, because I don't think you and I have ever really had as much as... First of all, everybody should know that Bill is the guy who stands at the head of the registration line going, go to position number two, go to position number four. And he, so he meets virtually every person that comes to the road rally. And he's kind of like the the greeter at Costco love, or Walmart. I love the one. I, yeah, I don't know about Costco or Walmart. But I actually, I've come to love that gig. Um, yeah, well, you know, look, those greeters are important. They set a tone, and and you set a tone for what the vibe of the whole weekend is going to be because you're kind and generous and helpful in, in that first contact they have with, you know, anybody who's related to the convention who's working there. And, and I, I think that it sets a tone, so good on it, you for doing it. And the energy you. on that Thursday night registration line is so 
vivid and it's so positive and people are so happy to be there and some of them have been there since you know seven or eight o'clock in the morning i know that's there. crazy to me i get it but i couldn't do it <laughs> yeah. and um so i i when i say you know welcome to the road rally how are you doing where are you from um it's it really you know i'm i it, it's a I, I get a kick out of it and um um, my biggest fear is that I'm going to uh, send you an email in August one of these years and say, "Hey, do you want me to do the registration line again?" And you're going to say, "No, no, we got we got somebody new and young. He's got a head full of hair, right?" Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, damn, man, that's my no, kid. You're what? not going to lose that gig as long as you can stand on your own two feet. You're good to go. Right. But yeah. um, is there? What do you think it is? Because honestly, the road rally has taken on a life of its own. It's more than I ever hoped it would be. What is it that makes the road rally so special? Do you have a, an opinion you'd like to share? Uh, probably, um, well, for sure. Um, this, this, this is a moment when I wish I had actually finished writing the letter that I had started to write to you a number of times. Um, you may recall that after the first road rally or the second road rally, I wrote you and Doug Menick a letter. And this was back in you know paper letter days. And I, at one point, I said, oh my, and I was just going on and on about how wonderful it was. And um, I said, oh, oh dear, I've started gushing and I can't stop. From the very first time, and it was relatively small, out in Woodland Hills at the Hilton there, which I believe was 1996, I think that was the first one. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, I think I sent you a copy of the, of the program that I still had. Um, and uh, so there was just... I mean, first of all, there are all these people there who do music, and we're all kind of in it together, and everyone has a different angle, but we're all kind of, you know, in the same mess. And the vibe was just so... Everybody was sitting around playing songs for each other, and everybody was talking about their stuff, and then you go into these panels, and you learn all these things. It was so uplifting. And um, I just... I mean, I've been to every one of these things, and, and one of the things that I would I wanted to tell you in this letter, which now I get to tell you right here, is that the rally for me has become, and it's been like this for a long time, it's this very big deal in the year. I know it's coming, and I know what it's going to be like, um, and I also will be, you know, I'll be candid about it, there, there are almost always moments when I will be going through a, you know, a, a, a not very... Uh, good time and i'll say oh i'm not going to go this year you know and, and the next thing i know it's like I, you know what nancy will say you're not going to go to the rally bill now how are you going to feel how are you going to feel if you don't go to the rally and so because she knows that when i come back from that thing i'm inspired i got all this information i've met all these people the rally is first and foremost the well gee i don't know what the what the extra priority is it's an absolute love fest People there have such goodwill. Um, Ooh, and yeah. to hear these people on these panels talk about all the inner workings of these things. And, um, and God, some of the people you had, you know, you had, you had Lamont Dozier there, you know, from, from Motown. And uh, it was amazing. And, you know, this past year, you had Jonathan Cain, you had Ken Calais, and uh, just hearing this stuff and just learning from it. For me, as a, as a teacher, um, it's just as important going to the rally to learn what's going on and to pass it on to my students and to these people in these schools as it is for me to know, oh, well, I guess I won't do that because no one's using it anymore because that's what I learned there. And it's also meeting people and, and learning to work with people and um, just, it's just, it's a, you know, you know, one of, the, one of the things about it is that if, you, if you've never been to one, it really is, it's important that you, you, you go to one just to see what it's like. And make sure you get some sleep before you go, because once you're there, sleeping really isn't part of the process. <laughs> exactly. Everybody looks like this, but we're all completely exhilarated. You know, we all just feel great. So um, that is... Um, in a nutshell, my feeling about the road rally. Um, you don't seem to have a problem with being shy and meeting new people, but I, I get emails every year from people that will confide in me. I'm shy, you know, I'm not great at meeting people. I'm not a great schmoozer. 
And I twist their arm a little bit and say, trust me, you have to just trust me. If you have any sense of who yeah. I am and that I'm yeah. honest from watching Taxi TV or whatever, um, trust me it, it, that you're going to get to the hotel and within 10 minutes of being in that building, you're going to feel like you found your tribe, your people. Uh, and, and I hear that over and over from people who are horribly shy that they yeah. come to the road rally and, and they find that they make their best friends in their lifetime at that. So yes. that's one of the things I never could have predicted. No, I mean, I, you know, the thing is, I had no idea what to expect. And um, uh, there's a, you know, there's a reason. I mean, I have all of my, oh, hey, wait a minute. Hang on. I can actually show you this. All Can your I badges, I bet. Oh, please. All right, I have, I have all of my all of my road rally badges from. Wow, <laughs> I don't even have that. I've got like two of them. <laughs> well, it makes it, it makes a nice piece of decoration in here. Um, and also, you know, students and clients come in and they say, because a lot of people they 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 say snarky things about taxi, and I say, well, how long have you been a member? Well, I've never been a member. <laughs> so, well, then, you know, maybe you should look into it. Um, so I. Um, I've had people swear that I must work for taxi because I'm such a fan and such a, you know, to me, it's like, this is to me, anybody who's serious about um, making some money on their music one way or another, if they don't join taxi, submit a lot of stuff and stick with it for at least three or four or five years, they're crazy, you know? And it's, um, it's like, it's a very small investment and also going to the rally. Because the rally, like you say, yeah. and it doesn't matter. There are people there who maybe they are wallflowers. You're not going to be a wallflower in this place. And also people are not going to be, they're not going to, you know, hit you over the head aggressively. And they're just, it's just the vibe. It's a love fest, right? You know, I'll say it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for saying all that. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Last year, we had a gentleman that was in charge of selling sponsorships for the rally. It was the first year that I've taken that responsibility off my own shoulders. And, and uh, he used to be the associate publisher of Billboard. He's put on a bunch of big conferences himself. He's sold sponsorships at other conferences. And he came up to me, he said, wow, the turn last year at this past uh, November, he said, the turnout's amazing, but that line, you know, I'm sitting here with a couple of my sponsors just looking at the size of the line. It's gargantuan. It winds all the way through the first floor of the hotel and it's five people wide. The line, the line. And he kept repeating it like the plane, the plane. And I finally <laughs> said, that line is not an accident because he wanted me, you know, you guys have to process these registrations more quickly. And I said, no, the line, people will get to the end of the line, finally get their badge and go, I just got my money's worth for flying out here just by being in the line, yes. just because yes. of the people you meet. We had one guy, uh, you may know him um, from Australia, and, and he happened to, he is a publisher, has a music library himself. One of our members uh, was standing, um, who's the other guy? Oh, I can't think of his name because I'm brain dead. Uh, Gentleman who hosted the other jam night, the guitar player from Arizona. Um, I'm drawing. Oh, it. oh, um, 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 Richard. Yeah, Richard Dance. Richard, Richard Dance. Dance. So Richard Dance came to his first road rally. Happened to be standing in line next to a publisher from Australia and got something of around a hundred songs of his picked up by that <laughs> publisher because of the road rally line. And he's. I mean, that was the biggest deal that's ever happened in that line. But we hear about people meeting collaborators in the line and meeting publishers and music soups in the line. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't doubt that actually some people have met on that line and they, they, they've had children and they're, you know, they're, they're you know. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 and again, I've worked that line. I've forgotten the, she was the CFO there. Um, and she used to do the line and she asked me one time I was walking by she said Bill can you can you can you handle this line for just a minute I, that's how I got the gig because she can't Kathy um, oh Kathy and, Genovese yes and Kathy right no no are you thinking uh, of Tina Scazzaro it's Tina exactly it's Tina right, right. and Tina <laughs> she said can you handle the line and she never came back right she came back and and she said and she said she leaned her she says are you doing okay? I said, yeah. She says, do you, are, are you, because I, I really would rather not do this. Right. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is fine with me. And I've been doing it ever since. 
But that line, people are thrilled. You know, the um, the with that length of time standing there, um, very few people actually have a problem. And their problem is almost invariably that they're 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 older and they just want to have some place to sit down once in a while. Right. So they're not. But they the line is it's a it's a great thing. Also, I got to say that the taxi staff um, and the way we've learned to work the, the line when people, when we finally open it, we process those people really fast. Right. We process that entire line. If we if we do doors at four thirty. Uh, at 7.30, the line's done. We process it. We, we do it like that. Yeah, and usually on uh, Thursday night, there's somewhere around 1,000 people, I believe, 800 to maybe 1,100 people. So that's a lot of people to process. But, yeah, the staff does a great job, and uh, yeah. you being the greeter really does set a tone. Um, it's it, it, it re It's reassuring to people. If they haven't been reassured by being in the line, that it's a, a place where you can just let your hair down and be yourself and make new friends. Yeah. By the time they get to you, you're so friendly. How could they not be convinced, you know? Well, yeah, and also the staff. Uh, the staff is also, they're always, and a lot of times they're, 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 there's a little problem here or some kind of technical glitch, but the staff never is anything but full of joy about the whole thing. So, which I think is, is I, you know, I, I don't know what you're doing, but it's great. whatever it is, it's really good. So We keep them well-medicated, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how do you decide what to record? Uh, I mean, do you just, are you a guy who waits for the muse? Are you uh, a guy who looks at the taxi listings and shoots at targets? How, you know, is there any routine in how you decide what you're going to record? Um, well, I have, you know, you know, again, we moved, um, I, my setup in Miami was just, it was very smooth and I had all, all, all my stuff was functioning. It was a very easy operation. So we came here and then we moved twice in two years and then I had to build a studio. Um, so it has been, uh, um, it's been a, a little, it's been interrupted to a certain extent. Oh, like well, a, let's forget the period as interruptus uh, and right, talk right. And talk about the bigger <laughs> picture. Then, but during that time, I have I've got a lot of sketches, and and the oh. thing is, the answer is yes to all of that. There are a lot of times when I'm when I'm warming up in the morning, and I'll play something that I've played 14 million times before. I will play a C major triad, and I'll think, "Wow, that's beautiful," <laughs> and so there's always that possibility. Um, then there is, you know, looking at a listing and, and uh, interpreting it and saying, okay, I can do that and I've got enough time to do it and the piano is tuned and bang, I, I do it. Um, uh, and I also, I've got, I've got probably 200, 300 sketches. Um, wow. Most of them now on, on a hard drive. I still have paper sketches um that you know written by hand I, I still do that i mean i will if i come up with something and the rig's not turned on i just do that which is something else anyone who is considering doing this um especially with the piano um they want to have their rig on pretty much as soon as they go to work as soon as they actually enter wherever they do their music because you don't want to have some idea come floating through and you can't just bang you don't want to you don't want to put it on your phone because a lot of times, that very first recording, it's got this thing that you, it's its like demo syndrome. You right. Just can't, right? You You'll can't, never nail it again that well. I, I would say half of my solo piano stuff are things that I just sat down, I had the rig on, and I just played. And, I, and, then I would, and the next day, I would listen to it, I would clean it up a little bit. A lot of times, I would never even go back and play it again. I would, you know, maybe play a little part of it, and the, you know, again, the, the piano is really stable. Its tuning is really stable, so I can get away with that for a couple of days. Um, but there's something about that very first thing. It's got this. It's got that this this connection and this heart to it that you might not get again. And so you want to make sure you've got it. You want to it's in your hand. I think in your case, a lot of that comes from the fact that you've played a million live gig gigs as well. Um, uh, yeah. 
I, I would imagine, because I, I know you well enough to know that you're a perfectionist, but I also know you well enough to know <laughs> that, you know, you've got live chops. That goes a very long way in the studio. It really does. I don't think people see that connection that often, but uh, oh. especially with keyboard players. I'm really glad you brought that up because when I went from tape to Pro Tools um, in 2004, three or four, um, when I when I was in New York and I I was a I became a really good tape editor. People would bring their projects to me just to just to get them to there and mark the thing and and cut the tape with a razor blade. I was mm -hmm. I got really good at that. Um, when I saw the editing possibilities in Pro Tools, I thought, wow, this is great. And I don't have to keep washing my hands. You know how you had to always keep washing your hands so that, you know, the, the oils didn't get on the tape? Yeah. Well, what I got into was this really bad habit of I really wouldn't, um, you know, even though I'm a pretty good piano player, I wouldn't really learn the tune. You know, if, if it were a tune that didn't happen, like I was just talking about, where you got it that first time and you got it, where it was a tune that was a little more complicated, really had to play it. Um, I would do six or seven takes, and then I would spend hours cutting and pasting. Hmm. So one of the things I would really suggest is shed your tune, practice, be able to play the damn tune like you're playing a live gig, and do two or three takes, right? And a lot of the time, one of them, actually, to me, every time, one of them, it's like, that's the body take. That is 95%. That's how I want it to feel. And also, since you keep referring to my perfectionism, I um, I, I like the Beethoven idea. You know, Beethoven, some student would come in and they would play one of his sonatas and they would make a mess of it. And, you know, old Beethoven would say, no, it's, it's something like that. That's okay. And, um, you know, my playing, I think it's because I didn't play as a kid. There's a certain bit of sloppiness in it. Um, depending on how much I've been playing and practicing. Um, so, but it, but to me, you can fix that pretty easily, but you've got to be able to play 95% of it well. You've got to be able to, and it's because other, after all, all that editing, the emotion starts to go out of the piece. So you got, you got to be able to play the damn tune. Do you play with a metronome? No. Um, and I've got another technical... Yeah. When I'm recording, yeah. When you're when recording, I'm, if I'm doing if I'm doing a um, if I'm if I'm doing a co-write with somebody and I'm just doing a piano track and they're gonna and they're gonna produce it and they're gonna add all this other stuff, then I'll put myself on a clip just to be just to be. My time is pretty good, but I want you know I don't want to be, I don't want them to call me back after I right. played what I think is a really Chasing, good yeah. <laughs> And they call and they call me and they say, "Listen, um, can you do it again and uh, actually make it 97 instead of you know 96 and then 97." And then 95 because you know it, it's to me rhythm is you know tempo is organic yeah but um, i do practice um still with a metronome uh pretty regularly just because i want to make sure i know where that pocket is going back to the studio stuff because i was just looking at the mics behind you i saw somebody asked um something about the studio what kind of preamp or, or interface do you use um i've got a focus right um a red oh, Right, ISA two. That's my uh, preamp. Okay. Right? Um, and I've got an RME um, interface. Uh, how do you like them? Very much. They were um, highly recommended by the people um, when I when the, when I went to my new rig. I had a G four, an old Mac G four. They finally caught on fire one night. So I got this nice new iMac and. And I, I had to, you know, and I had to dig this, this board, so I got rid of all that stuff. We've got this little tiny pre-Sonus thing, which is great, little monitoring station. Um, and the, the RMA is really, it's clean as hell. And the pre's on it are really pretty nice, too. Um, but the pre's on the Focusrite with the two large diaphragm, um, the, the AKG, the 241s, it's really, really, it, it's smooth as hell. It, it's, a, it's a nice sound, I think. Um, let's see, how much time do we have? We've got six minutes left. All right. Um, let's tell you mentioned collaborations a couple of minutes ago. Um, mm. how have you met your collaborators and how do you like working down a wire with them not being in the same room? Oh uh, boy, that's a, 
That's a big ass question. <laughs> well, give me a little ass answer because we don't oh, have much time. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times um, it, it's smooth and, and it, you know, everything works well. And also a lot of times it's clear that it's really not, it's not going to work out very well. I had a recent you mean uh, personality wise or work ethic wise or yeah, personality wise. And also just sort of the going back to professional etiquette, you know, uh, communication um, and, and trusting that you know, we're all aiming for this thing to be good. Um, I did a thing where the, the two other people had written, pretty much written the song. They wanted me to put the piano on it. Um, and it, it was a lovely tune, a lovely song. And, um, but there were all these, um, all these, other things that didn't go right um but you know generally i think that um i think that uh co-writing is it, it a lot of times it's a lot of fun and what you end up with is something that's really different than what you would have done by yourself which makes it that much more interesting um did i answer that question yeah you did uh one last question um should people who are thinking about joining Taxi build up a catalog before they join? Or is it better to just jump in and start creating music in response to the industry requests? Yes. Okay, good answer. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thank Actually, you. Um, at the, um, what's it called now? It used to be called the Mentor Lunch. A lot of people ask that. Oh, same the industry, eat and great. Eat and great. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's if you've got a back catalog. I mean, even if it's only you know five or ten pieces of music, then then join, because if you have an interest in in, in composing music, writing songs, doing film and TV, whatever it is, um, being part of Taxi uh, will inspire you, and it will and you start seeing these listings and you start writing toward the listing. But the thing that I run into, and you and I talked about this a number of times, especially early on. There are a lot of people who join Taxi and they sign up year after year after year and they don't submit anything. Right. Right. And so when I talk to these people um, during during that 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 lunch um, uh, that that meeting of, of the you know the people and those of us who are the mentors, I plead with them. I say, look, submit. You've got to you know write it and send it in. Write it and send it in. I mean, this this is Matt Hurt's thing. You know. You, you write it, you record it, you send it in, you, you put it in the pipeline, and then you do the next one. You know, it's, you do, you just keep keep doing it, and that's what you do. Um, so, yeah, I would say um, you can do it either way, but I to have a few songs in your pocket to start with is probably a good idea, but at the same time, you know, why not just throw yourself in and, and see what happens? I mean, I, I mean actually... Let, let me let me say that again. I actually think it's better if you have a couple of songs that you're pretty happy with, um, and they're good enough for someone else to listen to. That's where you start. I think okay. that, that's, that's where you start because that's at least you've got that foundation, and you know you've already got a couple of songs in the can. Because otherwise, it could end up being it could backfire. It might be a little bit intimidating. But then again, you know, if your personality is one that likes to be thrown into the deep end of the pool and you really can't swim, but you're going to get back to the surface, then 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 you could do that too. Um, you know what? I am going to ask you one more question. Uh, any advice for new members who are daunted by rejection? Oh, wow. Well, first of all, rejection, no matter how many things have gone well, it still hurts. There's still this moment of, um, but it hurts less and less. Um, <laughs> I get, uh, when I get the email saying, um, we listened to your track, but we're sorry, you know, from, from, from tax, we listen to your track, we can't use it. I realize, well, they can't use it, right? And it doesn't, it, it doesn't sort of change whether I'm a good human being or not, it's, it's not this. It's not this judgment thing. Yeah, and it's it may just, not even be that the music is less than wonderful. It's just not right for what they asked for. It's not, it's not for the thing, and, and uh, this is where the critiques can really come in handy because a lot of times the critiques, which can also be annoying, they can be jarring. But the thing is, if you've some, if you've got three different screeners on at three different points, say the same thing about one of your tracks. 
you might want to listen to them because maybe something's going on there. Um, That's truth in numbers. Absolutely. Yeah, rejection, rejection is something I think that learning to roll with the rejection punch is a skill. And I think it's something that you can only learn by by dealing with the rejection and realizing that it, it's it's for other reasons than they they didn't like the tune or something. Um, also, I mean, God, you know, the, 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 the music industry is called the, the industry of no for a reason. Right? I mean, there there was there was a guy I met at a rally, um, and met him at a rally, and uh, we talked a little bit, and um, I gave him uh, a couple of tracks on the CD. And he said, call me in six months. And I called him in six months. And his secretary, who's, who I got to know pretty well, um, you always get the assistant's name, um, uh, has it's so-and-so, does he want to talk to me? No, call back in six months. I did that for six years. Six years. And wow. finally, she said, oh, actually, he would like to, he, he wants you to call his partner in New York. And, and that was, that turned to be one of, one of the nicest, juiciest deals I've ever done. Yeah, it took six years. So persistence. Yeah. Wow. You know, so many people give up. They put their tail between their legs. They get a few rejections, and they think, "Ah, I'm not good enough," or the screeners at Taxi hate me. No, it's just not the right thing in the right moment. But persistence pays off, and you're a great testament to that. See, I've learned. I know the screeners at Taxi hate me, so I don't care anymore. I just- <laughs> So I, um, I I think actually to, to go, that that's one of the sensations you have to go through. You've got to feel this thing of oh man, I'm no good, and and um, and, and I'm going to go off in the corner. Well, go off in the corner. You off the corner for a day or two, and then yeah. come back. You know that's what you do. You get knocked out of the ring and get back in. Absolutely, a skill um, you learn to roll with it. Which means the next time I get rejected by a taxi or somebody else, I'm going to call you and I'm going to weep into the phone. <laughs> I've had people do that. It's tough. I bet. I bet. It's really, really hard. You know, it's, we don't want to be in the business of breaking hearts. We're in the business of empowering people to make money from their music. Sure. sure. Well, yeah. with that, I've got to, got to get out of here. We're a couple of minutes over, but uh, man, you've been a great guest, and congratulations okay. uh, and hang for hanging in all these years and being persistent. And, and thank you for being the greeter at the road rally and putting smiles uh-huh. on faces. No, yeah. it, it really does make a difference. And I'm usually running around uh, checking a million details. I don't know that I sure. ever thank you as much as I'd like. So thank you. I, 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 you know, this thing of putting taxi together and doing the road rally and all the stuff you've done, you have made the world a better place. And that, uh, it's a great thing. Thank and, you. Um, I just, you know, anybody... Anybody who doesn't think about coming to the road rally should come to the road rally. They should just come and just experience it one time. It's a life changer for sure. Uh, people don't believe all the hype, but it's not hype. It's truth. And then they come and they go, this is better than I thought it would be. Yeah. So I well, love that. Tell, tell them to call Uncle Bill. I, I, will, I, will, I will. I will give them all your cell phone number. Yeah, and, and tell them that you're more than happy to give them tons of advice on everything. Uh, And I want to remind you guys, well, I don't know if it's a reminder so much as informing you that uh, next week we're going to be joined by um, Andrea Stolpe, who is a hit songwriter, and she's written a a book. uh, I can't remember the title of it because I'm brain dead from flying, Um, but it's the first time she's ever been on the show. She also teaches at Berkeley and at USC, so I'm looking forward to having her next week. And with that, Bill, I want to say thank you. You were a great guest. Please give my love to Nancy and uh, give me a week to recover from jet lag uh, and send me a recording so I can give you weigh in on your piano miking stuff. Okay, well, you better like it, otherwise I will weep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't want that. No crime, Bill. <laughs> yeah, so thanks for having me, and uh, best to everybody there. Best to the staff and everybody. Thanks, Bill. Right. Talk to you soon. Anyway, See everybody next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye-bye. Ah, the crowd loves it, baby. Woo-hoo.